Hello and welcome to the first episode of Series 3 of the Woman of Nottingham podcast. I'm your host, Kyra, and I am joined today by Rose Thompson, executive of BME Against Cancer and founder of the Sisters Against Cancer Support Group. Rose challenges the way in which Black and ethnic minority communities are treated in regards to cancer. Losing her own mother to the illness when she was young, she set out to develop safe spaces and information for Black and minority ethnic groups in a time where they were young. I'll be speaking with her on her journey and how she got started and any possible solutions and how we could treat the inequalities Black and ethnic minority communities face in the medical field. I want to thank you, Rose, for coming today. My pleasure. And I think it's, it's fantastic. You know, we need to, we saw the film Hidden Figures and we need yeah. to showcase these hidden figures. Very true. Very true. So um, you have a support group called Sisters Against Cancer and to tackle the challenges in which Black and ethnic minority communities are treated in the medical field. Could you explain why you started this group and why it's so important for you? Well, you have to go back to the beginning because mm-hmm. my mother, um, she, she um, passed from breast cancer when she was 47 yeah. and we didn't know that she had it until the last six months because we come from a faith group. She was praying for divine healing. And mm-hmm. also I realized um, my mother was a seamstress and she supplemented my father's earnings by sewing. So I think she kind of put it off as well, because in those days you didn't have the benefits and stuff that you have today. You had to keep your family. And there were eight of us. Um, This was 1976. I think had she been faced with it today because cancer treatments have improved, she may well have had treatment. It wasn't the same then. Um, So I started when I, after I lost my mother and my twin sister to breast cancer, my twin sister passed in 2001, mainly because um, health professionals lacked awareness, but because um, our communities lacked awareness about cancer because we weren't seeing much of it. Um, So I actually am a qualified radiotherapy radiographer. Initially wanted to be a doctor, um, but the school I was going to closed in my last year, we didn't even get taught. So I managed to get into radiography school and through that um, I um, had the knowledge about cancer. And even though I was in my last year, my mother didn't speak of it. And we're still getting people who are passing very, what seems like suddenly who may have had it and not spoken about it and lacked awareness about it. So I wanted to raise awareness and to say to our community, even though we thought we didn't get cancer because we didn't know anybody who had cancer when we were younger. We are aging, um, we have more elders in our community. It is much more common in elders. And there are some specific cancers like prostate cancer and breast cancer that we really need to take note of and bowel cancer too. Um, So yeah, I did it because of my family's experience, Um, but Then I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015. It didn't show up on the mammogram, even though I was having annual mammograms because it was in an awkward place between the breast and the chest wall muscles. So it had already got to stage three. That was six years ago. So I teach people as well, you know, that even if they have been diagnosed with late stage cancer, there are still things that they can do themselves and also that um, they need to be involved in conventionally. So I was meeting women, you know, along my cancer experience journey and they were not supported and they lacked awareness about what was happening with them and you know the things that were available to them so Paula Edwards and myself Paula had kidney cancer this is against cancer isn't just for breast cancer um just decided to um start something and we tried it first and because we were both going through so much it didn't work plus there was a another woman um, who was an Asian woman who wanted to be involved, but sadly she passed. Um, and we tried again after I was diagnosed and it's grown. Um, in fact, we've had since the pandemic, women from other cities getting in contact with us as well mm-hmm. since we've been on Zoom. So yeah, that's why. Um, I just can't bear to see people suffer unnecessarily. 
same, same. No, I think that's pretty yeah. great. And especially because I was reading, um, slightly on topic, especially because I was reading so much about Black women, especially how we were guinea pigs um, during slave days for um, like smear tests and, and how they just didn't, and, and how the birth rate for Black women who were given birth where we had, we had high numbers in traumatic births, school births. You know, I feel like this is such an important thing that you're doing and thank you for doing so. I haven't, I haven't um, known anyone with cancer, but I know it takes, it takes a toll on us. And especially as black women, we aren't really seen as much. We aren't heard that much, um, but we should take up space as much as possible because we're not going anywhere. And I feel like, our voices just need to be heard. So I want to thank you yeah. for the work that you're doing. Well, I think you just raised an important point there because um, particularly with COVID and cancer and, and, and we had the same thing with cancer at the beginning. A, people didn't believe it existed. Yeah. Um, and secondly, because they weren't seeing it in our community, they certainly didn't believe it existed in our community. They thought it was just um, a, a non-BME condition. Yeah. But lifestyle you know, really has a lot to do with it and changing lifestyle. And ours has changed since coming to this country as well and going to other countries. But the, we did um, a survey of black cancer patients and carers around COVID. And what kept on coming up was the trust issues because of mm -hmm. past wrongs. And, yeah. you know, well, people could say, well, that's in the past, but, you know, we've still got the Windrush scandal going on. We've just heard that more people are going to be deported. So the trust issues are very big. So it was important that those of us who have some experience and knowledge, and I don't just mean professional knowledge, who look like yeah. each other, yeah. actually are in there, actually raising awareness and supporting people. And it's not just about fundraising, it's because we care about people. It's about, you know, um, people not dying prematurely. You know, we, we, we have a lot of black women who are getting what is called a non-hormonal breast cancer majority of breast cancers are hormonal where the mm. breast cancer cells are fueled by hormones but we're beginning to see particularly in, in some of the African countries like Nigeria where women are being diagnosed before they, they're even invited for screening under the age of 50 because this non-hormonal is called triple negative breast cancer is more common in black women and um, we need to know why mm. so you know, I'm interested in seeing more people coming into the professions and actually doing the research. You know, it was lovely to see, for example, the black doctor who was a dermatologist put something up about the fact that dermatology did not have even photographs of um, the rashes and things and how to check um, dermatological conditions on skin. I mean, I developed shingles on my wrist um, just after um, I finished chemo. And I had to self-diagnose that. Um, it was, it's always happens over a bank holiday when you can't get anyone um, because I'd been given the wrong thing. Um, and I knew that if you have a five day course of tablets, you can prevent that, that rash really spreading and, and becoming very painful. So it's teaching people what's available, but also developing culturally competent services as well. And I really do feel now that in our hospitals, in our statutory bodies, in any um, service that wants to, wants to work with, um, I call it BME, B BME population, yeah. um, that they really need to be measured for cultural competence. They really need, and part of that measurement is having people in their workforce who look like you and me. Yeah, I think that's a great point too. I think um, when you see people that look like you, it kind of represents who you are, what you are. So um, with those issues in the past, not being there, seeing a black doctor, a black nurse, it kind of yeah. shows your faith that, oh, they're not just going to dismiss me anymore. So yeah. Um, the work you have done and continue to do, do you think much has changed for black and minority communities in terms of us getting the right medical treatment and being taken seriously when it comes to issues with our health? Do you think anything has changed with us being um, seen? 
Well, I can only talk about what what we've been involved in. And I know things have changed, particularly for our men. You know, I, I wrote two reports about black men and prostate cancer. Um, they're on our website, bmecancer.com. Um, and they were called Hear Me Now in the Caribbean. Um, if you listen to our um, artists who do reggae music and stuff like that, you know, sometimes they will just, in the middle of the, if the singing yeah. that hear me now kind of thing. So yeah. it seems an appropriate thing to call that first report, um, which I actually wrote after we, we had never had the statistics of black men death rates from prostate cancer until 2012. Mm -hmm. And I campaigned for that as well and, and asked, you know, those who were collecting those statistics for it. So when it came out and I saw that black men in England were twice as likely to die from prostate cancer and in where we live, the East Midlands, three times more likely to die, I just started writing and um, managed to kind of get it to the point where we launched it at the House of Commons with a little help from supporters. And um, 80 odd people turned up in the dining room and David Lammy launched it for us. And I just thought, well, I've made my point now, you know, black men are um, two to three times more likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer in this country. Because all the other stuff we were getting, we were getting from America on African-Americans. Um, we needed some evidence for here and that it is unacceptable that they are two to three times more likely to die. And actually it may be higher than that in some cities. So I just wrote it to highlight that and to say to statutory bodies and public health, you know, you need to look at your own statistics yeah. and actually check what you are doing about it. And if you are reducing the death rates yeah. and they weren't. And really, the subject of prostate cancer and black men have gone off the boil. You know, you have a lot of charities that were raising awareness about the symptoms, but what we wanted to do was what Professor Frank Chinigwondo, who is a friend of mine, consultant, urolo urological um, consultant surgeon um, of Nigerian descent, we just wanted something to be done that was actually proactive and actually checked the men at an early stage so that you could actually catch it before it became a death statistic. And so Frank had done this clinic in Newham, but he'd done it with not just prostate cancer, he'd done it with diabetes and everything. And he'd hoped that, that it would be funded by some of those, you know, same charities that are doing a lot of awareness raising and by statutory bodies, but it wasn't, didn't continue. So we took that model and repeated it in, in Nottingham. Um, after I wrote the second report, which was called the call to action and actually used the evidence in that to get the Nottingham City CCG clinical commissioning group on board. They had some funding, they listened to us. We'd been to public health and we'd been you know, to lots of others before, but it was the CCG that really listened. Yeah. And we were already working closely with the urology department and set up the check things out or check things out um, community clinic at the African Caribbean National Artistic Center, ACNA Center in St. Anne's, where it is actually where I was, was born, Robin Hood Chase. Yeah. Um, not in the ACNA Center, but in St. Anne's. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 yeah, I know. I, I live yeah. in St. So. Yeah, and we checked over 300 odd men. Some of those men had a family history and just a handful were non-BME, but the majority were black men and, got them followed up by their GPs as well. So I met one the other day who said, thank you for doing that because my GP is following me up every year. But we've since found out that some GPs have stopped following up the men. So mm. we can go back. In fact, urology told us that. So we can, you know, just raise awareness that they need to do that as well. And I hope this program will do as well. Um, you know, same with the Sisters Against Cancer. I know that some of those women would not be here had we not started that group. And I know if it wasn't for my knowledge, I probably wouldn't be here because um, when it was found, it was sitting between the breast tissue and the chest wall muscles and it didn't show up on the mammogram. So it had already gone into seven of my glands and I went straight into treatment. And because I know how to handle it, I was just saying to somebody 
it's the first time uh, two weeks ago that I've ever experienced my work, white cells being so low that I'm practically immune deficient, but I know what to do. So I come off the treatment for, I'm having immunotherapy, which is targeted um, tablet treatment that just targets the breast cancer cells. And it has worked for me for three years, but sometimes they need to find something else because in the same way that COVID mutates, cancer mutates, so yeah. I'm kind of at that stage now. But I know what to do and I know how to advise others. And, I, I, and we're running a patient advocacy project where we, we are, I need to advertise this, but it's we're allocating, we've got two advocates, allocating them to patients who may not be able to get in contact with someone, may need somebody to go to the hospital with them. Um, and we want to expand that next year. So I know we've made a difference because yeah. people tell us, um, but um, I just feel we've made a difference because we, we've got a diverse workforce. We've got a lot of good volunteers, but what I would like to see is more BME led organizations. Cause in the long run, you don't have to explain things to BME people, <laughs> you know, they understand the culture. You know, it's even things like with Sisters Against Cancer, you know, most of the support groups that I've been to or supported, it's a nine to five thing. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, once five o'clock's gone, their, their groups don't communicate much. But we kind of just let self-help groups evolve in the way that they want to. And in the end, I realized that like me, a lot of people are up a bit later because they're so busy in the daytime, they're chatting with each other after midnight, which we do encourage people to get some sleep. But, you know, for some of them, that is their culture. I mean, when my mother was sewing, um, she would sew mostly in the night because she had eight kids, basically. So we would sit up with her and keep her company. Yeah. And it's very important to get sleep, but I realized that, you know, for some people that's not going to change for now. So I just said, well, if you don't want to get those messages after midnight, then, then mute, you know, go to sleep and mute. Um, and those who want to talk to each other can do. So we don't, we're not rigid about making things the way that non-BME people would do it. We have to evolve in the way that, um, you know, suits our members. Hmm. So you were recently nominated for the Lifetime Achiever Award back in May. How does that feel for you? Oh, do, do you mean, I mean, I, I have several awards and to be honest, I kind of was not an award person. And yeah. what happened, I, I already have a Lifetime Achievement for um, a National Windrush Award. I have a special recognition of awards from the Phoenix newspaper from Kemet FM because Christine Bell and I did the health show for some time and we still want to come back and do that but for now I've had to focus on the frontline services keeping people alive basically and giving them support but um, I think you're talking about the national diversity yeah award yes, one I yeah yeah I that kind of backfired for me because um, I have been following the National Diversity Awards, but I don't really know them. I just think it's important. And it's based up in Manchester, which is a bit different from it used to be in London. And it's quite high profile. So I actually put out a message to um, say to people, please nominate organizations that are BME for this as well, and diverse organizations that are BME led. And then somebody who saw that nominated me, which was not the idea because I've got enough nominations already. <laughs> and I've got an honorary doctorate in social sciences from um, Nottingham Trent University, you know, which I always wanted to be a doctor and I actually turned down doing my PhD to, to start the charity. Yeah. So it seems like what goes around comes around. And when I got that doctorate, I'd just finished chemo and I hadn't realized how big it was. Um, until I went for the robing ceremony, which the robes were like Caribbean colors. So when I put yeah. them on, I said, Jamaica, and you know, that sort of thing. And then I opened the book because you sign a book and they yeah. take a photo and you're in there. 
as a historical record. And the page before me was Lenny Henry, so Lenny Henry. So I thought, well, this is a bit bigger than I thought because <laughs> um, my, my two eldest children, they didn't go to their graduation ceremonies. So I've only ever been to one, which was my sister's was a nurse and it was a very long ceremony. So I don't think I fully got what that meant until I went there. And I'm grateful for that because it leads the way for students to see that, you know, the black students and black women to see that they can do those things. Now with the National Diversity Awards, it was a bit different. Um, people started voting, but they actually weren't able to get through. Mm -hmm. And um, so my daughter did contact them and then they sent me something about I'd been nominated and I needed to send them something. And I did send something, but never heard anything else apart from um, that I'd not been, I'd not got, got through to the later stages, which doesn't bother me because um, I um, was really trying to get other people to be nominated, but it was nice to be nominated for it. Um, so it's not gone any further. And I think there have been some issues with people voting online with those things since the pandemic. And mm. we certainly didn't really, a lot of people were saying they were trying to vote and they, it, they couldn't vote basically. So, um, you know, I, I want to see others nominated now. I want to see you nominated, you know, <laughs> just you nominated. And, um, you know, some of the next generation nominated as well. I think that's really beautiful. I think that's really beautiful. Do you think that it's up to us as a community to change the way we've been perceived in the medical field? Or do you think non-Black non communities should, should take it upon themselves to know better? I think, you know, I've been involved in education for a long time. Part of my role when I worked for um, Europe's leading um, uh, cancer information support charity, Cancer Black Up, was to educate health professionals. Um, you may hear the vacuum cleaner in the background because somebody's okay. helping me today. Okay. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to tell her to stop because she's going in a minute and I can't do it. Um, but I kind of, I feel that I call it corporate memory is lost if you only have a couple of people interested. I'm interested in seeing whole organizations. You know, I will, if an organization gets in contact with us and wants to work with us, I'm kind of looking at your whole organization. I'm going on your website and seeing how diverse you are. Um, I'm seeing just like with COVID, I was watching that program that the DJ was presenting about all the interest in Black Lives Matter and, you know, influencers and being approached by these big branded companies. And then six months later, it had all gone poof. They weren't interested anymore. And then when he invested, investigated their workforce, they were not recruiting BME people. Or it's not just recruitment, it's retainment. Yeah. Because I, as somebody who was at the top of my field in the charitable sector, in a charity that was started by a Chinese endocrinologist who got ovarian cancer, was um, fortunate enough to be um, in an organization that listened to me and that gave me the authority to do what I needed to do. But I soon became the agony aunt for a lot of, um, not a lot, because there were less than 1% of the cancer charity workforce is actually BME. And those few that did get it found that it was, they may have got the job, but it didn't mean that they were mentored and supported. And so sometimes they came to me. And at one stage I did actually survey the charities to see if things had improved and they hadn't. And I think if you do survey even cancer services now, you know, we noted that even in breast cancer services, there were no black nurses um, in our local hospitals. So that has changed, but it's the first one, I believe in over 30 years. Um, she's of um, black African heritage and I'm really pleased about that. And wherever we see it, we will speak out against it and we will, you know, we, Sisters Against Cancer has attracted a lot of Caribbean women and some African women. 
but we also have women who were the partners of black men. We have women who worked with those women who are, are not black as well. We welcome anyone. And it's not just even about women. We understand that some, some people, you know, identify as women as well. So I've had those conversations with, um, with the group and we help anybody. But I just feel that we've got this, this, this thing going around unconscious bias. Yeah. You know, I just have to ask questions about that. I've seen it occasionally when I've worked with colleagues and they really, in fact, somebody said to me, I was visiting the Maggie Centre the other day and I was talking to a former nurse who was, had lost someone. And, and I said something about the hair loss stuff. We just managed to get um, the, the, the a service that actually will be fit for purpose for black women, Asian women. It wasn't there before. But it's taken us a long time, two and a half years, just to get the hospital to the state where um, qualified black and Asian hairdressers and ethnic hairdressers can apply for NHS vouchers for people to get wigs off them or get a hair service. So I just feel that happened because I was sitting on that steering group and we had people who were culturally competent from the I don't like the term BAME, um, but actually it's one of the reasons why we changed to Be Me Against Cancer, because the debate about whether it's ME minority ethnic or BME or BAME or BAMER with refugee on the end was actually taking over. Um, I, it took two and a half years and I just feel now that there aren't the same excuses as there used to be for not recruiting people and not retaining mm -hmm. people. When I joined the charity, I was having clinical supervision, um, which is when you have somebody who has a counseling background that you can talk to about some of the more difficult things that you're dealing with. Um, but for me, I needed a mentor. So um, I met somebody who actually came to speak at a council house event in Nottingham on the train Beverly Hunt, she worked for the King's Fund at the time. She was leading on diversity. She was of Bayesian descent and she had gone through a lot of the things that I had as a nurse and worked her way to the top. So she became my mentor and I have to thank her for a lot of what transpired after. She was the one who told me, you know, I'd kind of, I was ready to do my own thing. I'd outgrown kind of where I was working. And that was quite capable of doing my own thing. I didn't even think I would be capable of leaving the hospital and managing a drop-in centre and doing a national job. In fact, I turned down the national job that Cancer Backup offered me to begin with because I was just going to go back into the department and do what I was doing all the time. I didn't feel that I was capable. I'm telling you, and I'm, I hope, I'm telling all these young Black women and Black men and Asian women and Asian women, you are probably more capable than some of those people who are in those jobs. And I, that, that's what I actually found, that my background in cancer, because radiotherapy radiographers, 99% of what they do is cancer. And they actually helped the nurses in Not Nottingham to set up their degree. We were already doing it. And then to be told by charities that actually only nurses can work on helplines and develop information. I didn't take that. And then they said, well, only you can do it. You know, you're unique. And I said, no, that's not true. And by the time I left, there was another radiographer running a centre down in Torbay. So I think, yes, we need to develop our own services. Um, but I also feel that there's a lot of things that benefit us, that um, there's a big inequality there because we don't know about it and we're not offered it. Um, and we need to be. And it shouldn't just be one person in the organization driving it. When diversity and equality is the center and cultural competency and you respect different um, races and different ethnic groups, you have a much, much more effective um, workforce. And I don't think we have that in the NHS. 
I don't think we have it in local authorities. We definitely don't have it in, um, you know, the home office and places like that where we should have it. Um, so we need to change the workforce. And those people mm -hmm. should not be people who just come in and I don't call things menial jobs because we've seen in, in COVID that it is the, the people who have been doing the so-called menial jobs who have been the most important. Yeah. You know, the yeah. carers, people who clean, you know, it kind of, I'm, get, I'm happy to talk about NHS history, but, but it seems to just be focused on nurses. And I believe I was probably maybe the only black radiotherapy radiographer when I trained and qualified in 76. And I've joined the Nigerian radiographers conferences and I'm still the only radiotherapy radiographer there. And I speak at the, I've spoken twice, 10 years apart um, at the National Radiotherapy Conference and seen very little difference in, in black um, and ethnic uh, radiographers joining the ranks of radiotherapy. Allied health professionals, physio, OT, it's very white. O oncology is very white. And um, it was a white man who wrote the Snow White Peaks of the NHS and noted that at those top positions, you just do not have black people. So I've linked him with the um, NUH NHS Trust, our University Hospitals Trust, um, BAME staff group through Aquiline, who's a matron, and she's um, originally from Zimbabwe. And then we've got um, Liz, who's from Brazil. And they've been very helpful at making some of the things that, to be frank, I'm tired of going around in circles with the NHS, but having their backing and coming together as a force with Sisters Against Cancer has given us a hair loss service that we hope will be fit for pra practice. And actually it's a model that other hospitals can, can um, yeah. copy. And I've been told by Alison who, who actually helped in the Mill and Dropping Centre that Leicester's already interested in following us. So if we can set things like that with everybody who is in a strategic authoritative position, you can change a whole organization. But one racist person can also destroy an organization. So I think anti-racism should be taught and anti-discrimination as well as equality and diversity. Because people don't realize it's no longer the organization that could be prosecuted, it's you since the Equality Act. So um, it's important that that education, which I hope won't be needed as much because our children are growing up in a diverse population. Yeah. And Nottingham has one of the most integrated populations where you, when my father came here in the mid fifties, you know, he, um, it wasn't a mixed population. He was one of the first that, but when they started discrim the the, re the landlord started discriminating against the Irish as well, what it did was it drove those two communities together. So most of the friends that I have that are of mixed heritage, yeah. they are Black yeah. Caribbean and Irish. white Irish. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's that shared experience that brings people together in the support group and in this world, really. How do you think non-Black communities can better educate themselves about Black people and the lesser children in this world? Well, I think it's that, I'm going back to Be Me Against Cancer and the reason why I named it that. BME is something, is a title that we didn't give ourselves, but I'd never heard of it until I started really delving into why um, black people were not seen in the radiotherapy department. And that's when we found out there was actually the Department of Health and the National Cancer Team, actually action team made 60, 60 million available to actually start to do something about it. But most of that funding went to organizations that were non-BME. So I said, well, where did this, term BME come from because I don't remember being consulted about it. Um, and I just started to think, well, it doesn't, it's not really inclusive for every, everybody. But um, at the same time, we need to highlight inequality, inequity. 
So there has to be something that makes it stand out. But um, the be me, put yourself in my place, is my answer to your question. I am tired of getting email after email expecting us to volunteer to recruit people for um, research and whatever when, and, and there is a paper on funding inequalities for BME um, organizations, when these organizations might have got a big pot of funding and then they expect us A, to come to where they are and B, to voluntarily do it when they have got funding. And um, I also feel, feel quite strongly about so often support groups and, and groups that are set up have said, oh, you no, know, we, we really, we would really like our, our group to be more diverse, but you know, we invite them to our, our meetings and they won't come. You need to go. That one of the um, most interesting talks that I ever went to was somebody who became a friend, but sadly um, died at a young age and his name was Les Weeks and he worked at Hayward House Hospice. And they used to have a very good educational program that they would advertise. And Les was doing a talk about basically cultural competence about the time that I, I was about to change, um, leave the department and start working with the charity. And I was running the drop-in center. And I kind of went because um, I was interested, but I didn't expect to hear what I heard. Les spoke about the Caribbean community like he was a Caribbean community member. And he spoke about all communities like that. And I said, Les, how come you know so much? I said, I came here a skeptic. And it was like, you were my brother. He says, I did it for my PhD or his master's. And he said, what I would do is I would go out. You know, I spent time in church services. I sat down and talked to elders. I sat down and talked to youth people and I did it for a year. And I still, talk to them basically and learned a lot from that don't expect people to come to you you go and find out what is happening in their space you know if you put yourself in my place you'll have a much greater understanding and I find when I talk these days that many people are saying well I didn't know that um, and there's that other saying NIMBY um, N-I-M-B-Y not in my backyard if it's not in your backyard, if you don't, you know, yeah, you yeah. never connect with people, how yeah. are you going to learn? You know, just yeah. talking to, because the African community and the African Caribbean community work closely together, but the culture has differences yeah. um, from the Caribbean to the African continent. So we've learned things about each other. I mean, one of, um, the things I discovered that was in some languages, there is no word for cancer. And I was talking to um, a, a woman that I met in London and, and she was saying in her community, the equivalent word was swarm, like a swarm of bees, because most people who got it, they were over, overwhelmed by it very quickly and they died. So we kind of want to make sure that everybody gets the same information cancer information in a way that is acceptable to them um, so that it helps them to be detected early. I was part of the awareness and early detection um, group that actually worked on the National Cancer Plan top up, the cancer reform strategy. And what was clear was that lack of cancer awareness is killing people, um, you know, I come from a faith community and say, because of lack of knowledge, the people perish. And we are seeing that now with bowel cancer as well, but African-Americans seem to be getting much more bowel cancer and dying more quickly from it. Where well, we didn't see that before, things have changed. So I think it's really important that, um, you know, we, we see more people in more senior roles leading on these things, but we also see a much greater effort. And I think part of that effort is reparations for past wrongs. Yeah. And I mean financial reparations. 
Um, you know, in some countries they may give directly, but I think if they give to those organizations that are actually making a big difference, it's easier um, because we do make a difference. And I wanna see future generations make a difference. I don't wanna see like if you took over from me that you're having to do what I did. Um, you know, when we came to this city, we thought we'd get funding. Yep, saying bye-bye to um, my cousin who's helping do the house, because I can't do it. <laughs> um, so I would really like to see funding not being, I think, I don't have to tell you, to get funding from Ajatu, you have to do proposals and bids and you have to um, jump through hurdles. It took us six months to get some lottery funding to do the patient advocacy thing and it's just development funding. And lots of questions coming back because people don't understand cultural competence and the differences and the fact that you're not just head, heading up the People see the, the title chief executive. I don't call myself chief executive officer because I'm not an officer. I call myself chief executive. Um, and they think you get some big wage and whatever. We've never got a big wage. We've had to put our own funding in to, to keep the organization going from the beginning through director's loans. And then when we changed to a charity, there was no way we could get those loans back. That, that was our life savings, basically. We've been to public health. We've been to... Um, primary care trusts at the beginning um, and just ask for small amounts even you know to launch our latest um, thing and every time they've got no money well it, it seems to be they've got no money for the BME community and if that continues to happen then we really need to harness the black pound more to actually work for our organizations and I think we're getting to that stage now um, and um, you know, we are, I am going to be doing a, bre a report on on breast cancer that one of the black organisations is actually um, sponsoring on black women in breast cancer. But I would like to see, like, you know, quite often we're a small organisation and um, if you raise awareness about the fact that you need funding, you know, people say, well, we don't know you. Um, we can't be known because we don't have the funding and the, the information and marketing departments that others do in the fundraising departments. We can't be known in the same way as, as larger wealth or cancer organisations are known. But when it comes to being effective and making a difference in the community, we've made a huge difference. Um, and I would just like more people to be aware of it and and put their donations where they can see it's making a difference. And actually, one of the ways that it makes a difference is when you see BME people at the helm. If you don't see that, you need to ask questions. So, um, yeah, I, I feel that we can't keep saying, you know, that um, organisations don't know. Once the internet came, once TV, when I was little, yeah. I think we had BBC One and BBC Two first, and then we had ITV. Three stations, and most people didn't have a TV. So you didn't know what was going on in the wider world. You read newspapers and whatever, but not everybody even did that. But now with um, the World Wide Web and every other thing that shows you what is going on with um, George Floyd and everything. I don't think there are excuses to keep talking about unconscious bias. I think um, there needs to be more diversity at the top in organisations. I agree. I think it's, it's important for non-Black and non-minority ethnic groups to have that bias, even if it is uncomfortable. Um, doing that, there, there can be some growth in humans. There is a reason why we aren't seen or heard, and um, that, definitely, that definitely does need to be challenged. Um, you said a while back that you worked, you were the only Black woman in the radiotherapy department. How was that experience for you? 
nobody believes me, but I'm a twin and I never used to speak. Yeah. My sister always spoke for me. And I got into radiotherapy when a t my, my school was closed. They had a notice to say that we're gonna be closed. And this was a political party that decided my sister went to the comprehensive school because she didn't pass her 11 plus and I did. It was an exam you took. And if you passed it, you went to a grammar school and if you didn't, you went to the comprehensive school. But then the government that came in decided they were going to close all grammar schools and they decided to close it when I was um, in my final year, about to do my A-levels and we had no teachers. But a forward thinking teacher before she left, because they all jumped ship, um, apart from a few, put some leaflets out. And that, that's how I went to visit physio, occupational therapy and decided on radiography. Um, and I didn't even realize I was the only one. And I was known for not speaking. In fact, my father kept every one of my school reports and every one of them said needs to participate in, in class discussions more. So um, there were things that happened that I think I, I could say was unconscious bias in those days that were a bit racist. Yeah. Um, but I always remember that I always spoke up because I was I taught. Brave of you. Yeah. I was raised in a family. I remember on one occasion, we didn't get any black patients at all, but there was a woman who came who had clearly had mixed race children with a black man. So she brought them with her. And there was a conversation because students used to sit in the waiting in, in the staff room with the staff. And there was a young radiographer who actually in the end left and, and came back and actually, I never really spoke to this about it, but she was actually friendly with, with the, what we call the orderly who did the portering and, and um, actually helped clean the department. And in that staff room, they were talking in a very derogatory way about this woman because she was with a black man. And I listened for a bit, nobody said anything. And I said, do you mind? And they said that thing that, you know, people who yeah. um, really don't understand they're being racist. Oh, we don't mean you, Doc. I said, you do. I said, you're talking about my community and if you hadn't noticed, I'm black. And there was a silence, um, you know, because everybody knew it was true. But what really kind of I am comforted by now is seeing people who, are, who don't look like me actually speaking out as well, actually standing with us against racism. And, it, and I, I learned later on that my tutor, her name was Miss Harper, before I even joined, probably about, um, maybe eight years before I joined, she had gone over to Kingston, Jamaica. She had recruited some um, Black Caribbean women to bring them over here to train as therapy radiographers. And she had gone back and set up the first radiotherapy department in Kingston. She never told me that. But my mother died just before I took my finals. And um, doing radiotherapy, exams was a bit like um, being a doctor. You had to do face-to-face -face vivas and, and the, they called it a diploma then. It's actually been upgraded to a degree. But I was interested in physics and she noted that I hadn't passed my physics and you had to pass them all to actually qualify. So she started asking questions and that's when I told, she, she found out that my, my mother had died basically. Because my mother had been for biopsy but she'd chosen not to have treatment. And that woman, the Queen's Medical Center Hospital was just being built and they just built the, the nurses quarter, residential quarter. She found me a room because I was the eldest at home with my father and six, um, one brother and five sisters. My older sister wasn't living at home at the time. And um, she found me a room in the, in the nurses home so that I could study because I was going to leave. 
I had had enough, you know, I'd been living with a mother who wasn't speaking about cancer. I didn't feel that I could speak about it to any of my colleagues because I didn't think they understand the faith group that I came from. Um, but this woman knew. And she created a way for me to pass my exams. Um, I don't ever remember being offered a job in Nottingham. And to be honest, nobody got pregnant, nobody left. So there was only one job. And there were only four of us that did radiotherapy. And one of those students got that. I didn't really want to stay in Nottingham. Um, but I was, in the end, encouraged by her to apply elsewhere. I applied for Leeds, Hammersmith and Westminster and was offered all three jobs and went to work in Westminster. And that was a totally different kettle of fish. There was a diverse workforce. There was a diverse patient group. So um, that's what started me. But I'm still passionate about seeing more people take up radiotherapy. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. What should a black people and other minority groups know when it comes to cancer? What are the signs or symptoms we should look out for? Well, I think the first thing they should know is that it can um, affect anyone and it it's not a curse. Um, because we basically have what they call familial breast cancer, where the, more than one person has been affected. Um, I have even had people from faith groups, not just black faith groups. When I speak about that, my mother had it, my twin sister, um, another sister, my aunt and myself say, well, you, it's time you prayed against that generational curse. Um, and I, take a stand against that, because even if they understood their own scriptures, you know, they, they would understand that it says that, you know, Jesus became a curse for everyone and died on, on the tree and took that. But I don't believe that. Um, I do believe, you know, like the story of Bartimaeus, that some of us go through things to change it as well. And that's very much what my family has done. And um, I just want people to be aware that it can happen at different ages, only 1% are children, but there are certain types of cancer because of, I think mostly for black and Asian people and people who live in countries where there might be less shared wealth. I'm not saying there's less wealth because sometimes it's wealth, but it's not shared. Um, you know, we talk about the Commonwealth and we know that the wealth in the Commonwealth was not necessarily shared. So I really do, want to talk to people about what causes cancer, the things, the known causes. For example, my brother-in-law, who was my twin sister's husband, worked in construction and he worked on roofs that um, contained asbestos. And that fit man who ate healthily, was very strong, developed um, lung cancer because of being exposed to asbestos. And in some countries, children are still playing with loose asbestos and exposed to toxins because of companies as well, um, leaving toxins lying around. So we know that a lot of the cancers that are formed in um, some countries, it's because of environmental factors, like Chernobyl, for example, you know, the fallout from that caused thyroid cancer in some East European populations and um, in young people. And then you've got the more common cancers like prostate cancer that is two to three times more common in black African Caribbean and African men. We don't really know why, but we certainly saw when we were doing the clinic that more of those men had a relative who'd already had it and perhaps not spoken about it. Um, and it was coming down through families. Um, and we know people dismiss genetics, but we've seen it, you know, when I was young, you didn't have the equipment to see even viruses because bacteria was bigger than viruses. You needed electron microscopes to see viruses. We know they exist. And now um, because of those, that equipment, we've been able to see genes and actually Leicester is the place where um, uh, um, they studied genetics and even a woman, you know, was very involved in in finding the double helix and things like that. So we know they exist, but we also know that there are some genes actually that 
um, were designed to switch some parts of genes, switch things on and off. And the breast cancer genes have a function that was a good function, but when they um, get the wrong messages and mutate, just like the coronavirus, they can do harm. So we know that there are three identified breast cancer genes, and it really came out of work with the East European Jewish population, that when it's passed down through generations, it increases their risk of, of breast cancer, but also of prostate cancer, of bowel cancer, of ovarian cancer. Some of these genes are linked and we want people to know the signs and symptoms. So you know your body. If something is persistent and you're going to the GP and you're not being referred for further um, uh, investigations, you know, I was in hospital over um, last May bank holiday just to try and get an MRI done because um, I did get spread into my spine. But there was a woman opposite me, you know, who thought that um, she had IBS because that's what she was being told over the telephone, which pandemic has made it much worse. And it turned out she ended up having an emergency operation for bowel cancer. So knowing the signs and symptoms of that, um, particularly somebody's persistently anemic, um, I had a, a, another support group where an elderly African Caribbean woman had been anemic for six years and just been given iron tablets without being investigated to find out what that anemia was. And she did have bowel cancer as well. So extreme fatigue, I don't just mean tiredness. I mean, you know, you are tired for no reason, even though you've slept, um, you know, lumps that come up that weren't there before. Um, in my case, it was, you know, lots of people believe that Breast cancer is always painless. My younger sister who got it, she had early stage breast cancer, which just shows up as calcium dots in the, the milk dots. It's not, it's, it's almost like pre-invasive cancer. It's not invasive yet. And yet she got pain. And so when she told me that, and I got pain down the side of my breast, I immediately called my GP and my family history nurse and, and got checked. And because no lump could be felt, even the breast care nurse said to me, well, it's probably inflammation. inflammation, but thankfully I had arranged a mammogram. And there was this three centimeter lump sitting in a place that nobody would have seen it. In fact, we had to ultrasound it to see it. And it had already spread seven centimeters down my breast and gone into glands. So I, the pain that I got with that was something I'd never had before. And I'd been to Regurobits because we ran a three year project with the um, British Heart Foundation and we kept it going. And I thought it was because I'd exercised, um, but it came back the week after and it was a, like a burning, gnawing sensation and I knew something was wrong. Um, you know your body, you know, just because you might not be able, some people, it's not always a lump, it's just a thickened area. Some people, they may, some people naturally have an inverted nipple, for example, but if it's not um, normally like that and it goes in or you get a te change of texture on the skin um, and just being aware and examining yourself, um, you know, when you're, we call it creaming up to get rid of the ashy look, <laughs> um, you know, with the soap in the shower, you examine under your arm, above your collarbone, because you've got glands there that serve the, the breast as well. And just take your fingers and just kind of go around and, and feel firmly. Not too often, because I used to do it too often. I used to cause myself pain from doing that. Um, with prostate cancer, women, I need you to really look out for the men. If your man is getting up to go to the toilet more than twice in, in the night, make an appointment. Um, it's very unusual under the age of 40, but we are beginning to see some African-American men being diagnosed in their 30s who've got a family history. So, um, you know, just be aware with the men in particular because they're less likely to have gone to the doctors as often as us. I mean, we have to go for, you know, we need to talk about young women, you know, the cervical 
tests that are being done, it, it's all changing. It's not just a smear, you know, you've got fluid stuff that you put it in and it's easier than it used to be. And there's even talk of a test that can be done at home now. And with bowel cancer, when people reach 60, they are invited to take, um, take part in the bowel cancer screening program and you get a kit and the number of people that just bin it. And I've sadly had, you know, experience of people who binned it, who then went on to get advanced um, bowel cancer and the same with the clinic. Some people who didn't come went on to get advanced prostate cancer when we could have picked it up early and they, you know, they could have lived. So educate yourself about the early signs and symptoms, but also if you have had it like me, educate yourself about where secondary cancer could appear, where it could return. The earlier you catch it, the less likely that is to happen. But in my case, as soon as I knew it had already gone into my glands, and when I had signs that it might be affecting my back, I got it treated quickly. Just one dose of radiotherapy and onto immunotherapy that targets, targets the um, breast cancer cells. So the more you know about it, don't get obsessed with it. Don't let cancer define you if you get it. Don't treat it like it's some, um, I think fear kills people more than anything else. But the more you know about it, the less fearful you are. My aunt's been joining, you know, some of the meetings to take the minutes and, and she admitted, you know, that she was really quite anxious about it until, you know, she joined. So educate yourself. I know, I think what you said about not letting it define you um, and not trying not to be so fearful of it. Um, me being a Debbie Downer, I have um, a polycystic ovarian syndrome. And um, if I don't keep an eye on that, it, it possibly could turn in, into ovarian cancer. But me being a Debbie Downer, having um, like I, I always hover over those situations and become very negative and thinking that there's no way out or how I want to have children I don't know if this is a possibility and I'm always always overthinking but yes. being negative I think it's very important to always always no matter how bad situations get to always try and see the, the silver lining and, and, and being grateful and seeing the positive thing that's really really, really yeah. important. and talking to somebody who's one step ahead of you who is overcoming yeah because sometimes yeah, you is. can talk to people who is one step ahead of you but they're very negative too yeah um and i th think in the meetings we are allowed to share when we're a bit low um but you know one of the things i've learned is that the patients who are ahead of me have taught me a lot um, you know, and some of the things that weren't happening that should have been happening, we made happen because they talked. And people who wouldn't talk when they heard us talk, sometimes we had speakers who came on um, and I didn't know they'd had cancer. And when they heard the women speaking, at the end of their talk, they said, actually, I just want to say this because I'm so impressed by you guys. I had cancer, but I hid it. And they start sharing mm -hmm. their stories as well. And it's those stories that empower people, you know, like, you know, I'm always dropping things and burning myself and whatever. And found that aloe vera is very good for, you know, the burns if you cool it down and put it on. And I wasn't even getting blisters when I used the aloe vera gel um, and the plant. And we share things like that, the natural things. Um, but we share, we share how we have been helped by services or overcome things ourselves or, something that, you know, we didn't know about natural things as well, you know, hair care and stuff like that. Like some of the women who, were, who had chemo were getting these little infected spots on their scalp. And I was asking the, the white British women about that. They weren't having the same experience as me. So I just got some antifungal and antibacterial shampoo, antiseptic shampoo and washed it and it didn't go any further. And then when I started talking to a cousin of my in-laws, hers had turned into this massive infection on her scalp. And that was what was happening with other women. So I called my friend who was a breast care nurse in Croydon and she's at St. George's now. Um, uh, we just did a, a breast care 
a breast cancer thing awareness thing for Jamaica Diaspora UK. It's still online now. You can go onto their website about breast cancer. And she said, oh, yeah, I see it all the time with black women. And yet you were not seeing that with, with the white women. So mm. I said to them, as soon as you see it, get a shampoo that is antiseptic. And if it was persistent, I got some antiseptic cream and just spot treated it. And they're all doing that now. Now your foot bottom might be dry, but there's things that you can use on it. I, yeah, my I friend, you know, people who make shea butter, you know, shea butter was not something that we used in, in the Caribbean, but when um, the African community started promoting it, we started getting it as well. And, and my aunt has only just started using it. It is perfect for our hair. Yeah, no, shea butter is really great. Yeah. But um, no, I do believe that it is very good to have a positive mindset and to also have a support group for even, like it's just important to have a safe space and then talk about these things because it is very scary. And it's, it's hard, I guess, to be vulnerable and put yourself out there and not, yeah. and, everyone, and everybody is afraid of the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen. So yeah, yeah. I think it is very important. And I, thank I, I thank, thank you for raising awareness about polycystic ovaries as well, because um, you said that that's what affected you, yeah? Oh, that's, yeah. 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 But, and, and there's a thing, I, um, I was seen at 13, but only diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome when I was 17. Yeah, um, that's yeah. the four so, years. Yeah, yeah. so I was just yeah. so annoyed. It's like, why didn't you see anything then? But... Yeah, similar to my daughter's got something that causes abscesses on the skin and they're very deep and they have to be operated on. Um, it's called hydrogenitis supravita and it really is painful. And she was 14 when she got first got it. And I think stress and all sorts of things trigger it and hormonal cycles and whatever. And again, it took her about four years to get a referral. Um, and now, we both started going, going for acupuncture because I started using it for lymphedema um, because I saw it bring my uncle's ankles down. I, it has made authentic Chinese acupuncture has changed her life completely. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's um, going back and changing to her diet medical. a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's yeah. going. I think it's going back to the the home medicines. I'm I'm Jamaican yeah. too, and my grandparents are always giving me herbal teas. I think they think tea can cure anything. Sarah C. <laughs> Sarah C. <yeah. laughs> oh, it's so bitter and disgusting. Oh, God, yes. And aloe vera juice on its own. So bitter, but they are detoxing, basically. Yeah. 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 No, my grandfather but, has the strength yeah. of something. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the thing is, they don't always read the packet properly because I was at um, my husband was raised in Wales, African Caribbean as well. And I remember I was there once and picked up one of the Cerasi boxes, you know, with the tea bags in. And on the back of it, it said, um, do not use if you have high blood pressure. I bet half of them haven't read it because every one of them has high blood pressure. <laughs> so you have to, to know both um, sides. Yeah. Well, I'm going to say, and, and lastly, um, this is going to be a big question, so it's okay if you don't have a big answer. But... What do you think institutions can do in five years or so that would help Black and ethnic communities? Well, I think I think the biggest thing is is actually start to look at your own institution and see how diverse they were and address that. And it's not just about um, recruiting people from abroad because there is that question: if you recruit people from abroad, what do you leave the country with? I've, you know, I went to, to the Guyanese High Commission and they were talking about the lack of um, cancer services in Guyana to the point that they'd had to get Cuban doctor, a Cuban doctor to come and head up the service. They didn't even have a chair that, that was suitable for doing chemo. So if you take away those few that you've got from countries that need them, you're not doing the world a great service. Um, but if there's a excess of people who want to travel, then fine. But at the same time, when they come here, if you recruit them and treat them badly, they leave. And 
not only that, you know, it's, I, I say it's not just recruitment, it's retention. You have to set up a mentoring program that is independent from the managers when you actually recruit people. I, I think just having people like me, like yourself, you know, doing this actually sets an example for our children and, and others. And, um, but it must not be as it is now. First of all, you know, one of the things that the, the Bay matrons did was actually look at oncology and see how white it was and actually start going and investigating different departments and raising it with the managers and saying, you need to do something about this because your workforce needs to be more diverse. The great thing about working at Westminster was that we, we did have radiographers who came from different countries, who spoke different languages um, and who understood, because we did take patients from different countries because, because so many countries at that time didn't have any radiotherapy departments. So it's important that you have that diversity, not that you use um, people who are not qualified interpreters, but I've seen it even in palliative care where somebody comes into the hospice who doesn't speak the language and actually it might be somebody who is a cleaner or you know serving the food who can speak to them now that's an extra skill you're asking them to do and also you have to make sure that those people understand the glossary of cancer because when I worked with the Turkish community in London one of the women who did speak the language went with the patient and the interpreter told the patient that they had bladder cancer when they actually had prostate cancer so you have to get that right as well but I just feel respecting each other's diversity is, is one of the first things and not just talking about faith when you're talking about diversity I want to see health professionals who understand you know people who I've worked with for years do not know that black men have an increased rate of prostate cancer I think that's what should be taught in academia and how to address it. And I also think they need to come out from their ivory towers, go into the community, set up partnerships with organizations like us and continue things like the community clinic um, so that people can have peers like Friends and Brethren was the other support group that we started and they're now an independent charity. Those men came to the clinics um, and they were there when other men came who, who, you know, had questions about prostate cancer and the tests, and it made a huge difference. So, you know, I think more things will be done in community um, and just the, the more serious things will be sent to the hospitals. I can see that happening already and more tests will be done in the community. But it's like I said to, um, I went to, something that was about digital, the future of digital um, stuff in the community, um, where they had a, one company had developed a strip that the patient had and they had a needle on the end and it told you all sorts of things that fed back. And my uncle has a heart condition and he has something fitted that feeds back to the hospital. But, you know, his was fitted in the hospital, but it takes him to connect it to make sure it's connected up and fed back and whatever um, to invite people into his home to do that. And you can give somebody something that's digital, but often in order for them, if they're suspicious of it, they're not gonna use it. So you need community members and peers to actually be the trusted links and also to be given the credit for what they do. Um, or we will be back to... Um, yeah phase one basically so I just would like to see more diversity and more respecting of it and change the word the voluntary sector we're all saying this in charities because it's called the voluntary sector um, it's also called the third sector um, or the charitable sector but the statutory bodies seem to think that we can e exist on fresh air and we see academia doing this as well, where they're just coming in and expecting us to recruit for them. It, it's another um, form of, of servanthood and slavery, I think, in expecting you get a, a 
huge part of funding and then you don't actually um, cover the fees of, of those who are working hard. Even administration is, is a lot of work. So I would like to see better sharing of funding, less hoops to jump through when you know how what we can do and um, more senior people recruited and supported in high places in these statutory bodies.